Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 21 says, Set up for yourself road marks. Place for yourself guideposts. Direct your mind to the highway, the way by which you went. Several years ago, I was driving through Louisville, Kentucky, making good time on the interstate. All of a sudden, I found myself on a side street, very much lost. I did the one thing I rarely do. Men, please forgive me. I, I broke the code of ethics. I stopped at a gas station and asked for directions. Actually asked for directions. I, I, yeah, had to, get, had to get off that off my chest, yeah. Once in my life, I asked for directions. Anyway, I asked the attendant at the gas station how to get on the interstate. He kind of gives me this nodding look, knowing look. Apparently, it was happening on a regular basis. The deal was there had been some construction on the interstate, and they put up some signs to direct people onto the bypass. They finished the construction. Didn't take down that one sign to get you off the interstate. And there weren't any other signs once you got off. So apparently on a regular basis, people are getting off thinking they're on the interstate. They're going on these side streets and they're stopping to that same gas station and asking for directions. Anyway, signs are very, very important. Road markers are very important. They keep us from making wrong turns. They save us a lot of frustration. Generally, they keep us safe. Not all road markers are helpful, however. And I brought along a couple of them that may... No, back up to that first one. We weren't done with that. <laughs> Keep right. You've probably run into drivers... Yeah, literally, run into drivers that do that. You know, the, the left turn signal's on and they... they yeah, you know. Anyway, kind of reminds me of the yogiism. You come to a fork in the road, take it. I guess you've got to take both, both. Anyway, the next one. Yeah, this one. Roundabouts. Well, that's kind of an oval, I guess. But I think it's... A, I hate roundabouts. I don't know, but I'm glad we don't have many around here. Up in Payson, there's a couple of them. When I was in Lafayette, Indiana this summer, they, they decided that's the newest thing in, in, in construction is with roundabouts. A British idea that should have never been brought to the U.S. as far as I'm concerned. Because I think it's a deliberate design for accidents. That's just my take on it. Once you get in the thing and you start going around, the only possible way out is you have to hit another car that's coming in. I, I see no other way around it. So anyway, an honest sign, I, whoops, I meant the first, look, I said I was sorry. You get in it and you just can't get, it reminds me of a Chevy Chase movie years ago, but that, that's as far as we'll go with that. Back to Jeremiah 31, signposts and guardrails as we look into this. I want to back up to verse 15. Verse 15, thus says the Lord, a, a voice is heard in Ramah. Lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. A verse you may not be terribly familiar with, but you may be familiar with it from the, the very familiar Christmas story. And, and so there is some important information concerning that verse in Matthew chapter 2. Again, the Christmas story, which will become even more fresh here in a couple more months. But you probably know the story about the wise men being drawn by the star to the birthplace of the Messiah. And they make the mistake of telling King Herod about it. And uh, when they mention about a king being born as king himself, as Caesar, he's not terribly pleased about it. And so he's made up his mind that he wants to do away with that king who is born. And so... As you know, the story goes on that Joseph is warned in a dream that Herod wants to kill Jesus. And so they leave by night and travel down to Egypt. And verses 16 to 18 include a reference to the verse that I just read. It says, then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah weeping 
and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. Rachel was the wife of uh, Jacob, who was later renamed Israel. She was the mother of Joseph and Benjamin, and if you know the story, she died in childbirth, giving birth to Benjamin. And she was buried in a tomb that is located somewhere between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And this phrase, Rachel weeping for her children, it is kind of a poetic phrase to describe the deepest grief and sorrow of the people of Israel. And Jeremiah happens to mention a town by the name of Ramah. And that town was located about five miles north of Jerusalem. And there is a reference here to a very dark time in Israel's history. The Babylonians came and they invaded Israel. And they came and they sacked and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. And many of the inhabitants of Jerusalem were taken north about five miles to the town of Ramah. And that was kind of a holding place for them before they went off into exile into Babylonian captivity. Very, very dark time for them. Being about five miles north of Jerusalem, it's entirely possible at night they could look at the night sky, they could see the fire in the distance of Jerusalem being burned, and in particular the great temple being burned and destroyed. Again, a very, very difficult time. And so no doubt the inhabitants realizing the next step from Ramah is they're going to travel a road they don't want to travel. They're going to travel a road into exile, going to a land where they don't want to go far, far away from their homeland. And so in a sense, Jeremiah refers to the, the spirit of Rachel. There is weeping concerning the children of Israel in great distress. And so it's a very, very dark time and an allusion to something very, very difficult. But you know, right on the heels of that, verses 16 and 17, before they ever step foot on the road of exile, before they ever began the journey into Babylonian captivity, God through Jeremiah extends one of the richest of promises to them. Verse 16, a note of authority, thus says the Lord, restrain your voice from weeping. And your eyes from tears, for your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord, and they will return from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your children will return to their own territory. The authority of God, saying, I know this is a dark time. This is the most difficult time you've ever experienced. But before you step foot on that road, before you head into a land you don't want to go to, I want to assure you that there is hope for you in the future. There, there is a future for you according to my plan. One day, maybe not you, but one day your children, your descendants will come back again to the land of promise. And that takes us back to verse 21 that we started with this morning. The meaning of verse 21 about setting up markers along the way. As they traveled down that road into captivity, they were instructed that they were supposed to set up signposts. And for them, signposts involved usually setting up a stack of, of stones. But whatever it was, they were to set up signposts along the way into captivity because the promise of God was your descendants are going to need to see them because they're going to come back to the land. They're going to come back and they're going to enjoy a future in the land of promise. They're going to return by the same highway that you went off in to exile. Verse 18 mentions a man by the name of Ephraim. If you're not familiar with who Ephraim was, he was a son of Joseph. He would have been grandson of Rachel, a grandson, of course, that she never met. But the descendants of Ephraim were part of the northern region of the, the nation of Israel. And he is also rather poetically described here as was Rachel grieving for her children. In fact, Ephraim represents something very, very important. And this is where the story is going to get very, very practical for us. Ephraim represents some signposts on the way back home to the promised land. And in particular, here's where it really gets practical for us. It represents our journey back to God when we have moved away from Him. 
In a sense, when we have gone into exile ourselves, when we've had that distance between us and our Father, when we've moved away from Him, the signpost of how to get back to Him. And I want you to really catch this because this is so very, very important. This is so very practical for us. There are about four signposts that we're going to take a look at here concerning this Ephraim, but signposts that mark the way for us back to God when we are not in the fellowship with Him that we need to be in and that we want to have. So having said that, I want you to look in verse 18. God says, I have surely heard Ephraim grieving. You have chastised me, and I was chastised like an untrained calf. Bring me back that I may be restored, for you are the Lord my God. What I want you to pick up on out of this is the first signpost being the signpost of grief. To bring it down to our lives. We don't find our way back to God when fellowship is broken. We do not find our way back to God until we also are absolutely broken concerning our condition. It is vitally important that when we are at a distance from our Father, that we come to that point of, of being literally heartbroken over our situation. To be able to ask, is my sinful pattern and my disobedience and indeed my rebellion, is it heartbreaking to me? Does it bother me enough that I'm at a distance from my Heavenly Father? Because this is absolutely the starting point on the way back. The signpost that we need to follow to get back to God. Bring me back, as Ephraim said, that I may be restored. Have I been broken to tears to say I want things right with my father when things are not right. 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 and 10 in the New Testament, I think fit very, very well with what we're talking here concerning this signpost. The Apostle Paul writes and says, I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow, this is especially important, verse 10, the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So when we're talking about being heartbroken over distance from our Father, there's a world of difference between godly sorrow and, and worldly sorrow. It's one thing to be heartbroken and to feel a load of guilt so heavy on our back that we don't know what we're going to do. That doesn't do anything. That's a destructive kind of a sorrow. We just sort of wallow in that. But there is a godly sorrow. And that is where I think the Spirit of God just cuts us to the heart and says, look how far you've traveled away from your Heavenly Father. And and, and that should bother you so that you want to move back down the road to where He is. And so that is a productive sorrow that leads, as Paul said, to repentance. And that takes us to the second signpost that we find in verse 19. And that is the signpost of repentance. Ephraim says, for after I turned back, I repented. After I turned back, I repented. After I was heartbroken over my distance from the Father, after I turned back, I repented. We talk about repentance quite a bit in church, and I don't know if we uh, really understand what repentance is. But repentance, uh, which comes out of good grief, if we want to call it that, the grief that, that turns us in another direction, is something very, very positive where we turn around and we face full on our sin and our disobedience and our rebellion. We quit playing games with God and with ourselves because repentance means literally a U turn. I turn around. And I say, this is the fact of my life. I've been living in a sinful pattern of disobedience. I I have been indulging in sin. And I now face the fact of what it is that I've been doing. I agree with God and what God already knows. You know, repentance, we think about talking to God about our sins. God knew it in the first place, right? God knows our sins. So what's the point of confessing them and repenting? It is simply coming to agree with God in what He knows about our lives. 
And the easiest thing in the world is to deceive ourselves. Well, that's not so bad, or I'm not really doing that. No, repentance is I turn around and I face that. I say, God, you are right in your assessment of my life. I'm living in a sinful pattern, and and I need to face this and do something about it. Again, sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret. It leads to salvation. It's like, finally, uh, it's got my attention, so now we can begin to do something. Addressing the problem, we can begin to address a solution. And that follows along also with verse 19, a third guidepost. On the way out of exile, back to God, is the signpost of instruction. I want you to look again. Ephraim says, after I turned back, I repented. And after I was instructed, I smote on my thigh. I was ashamed and also humiliated because I bore the reproach of my youth. So, to be instructed, the signpost of instruction, where God speaks to our hearts and our minds, and it is not necessarily an easy thing. Because if we open ourselves up, having faced our disobedience and sin, opened up ourselves to God, talk to me about what's wrong in my life. And when God begins to talk to us about that which is wrong, it may be very hurtful initially. Here's the implication of sin. Here's what's involved with with what you have done wrong. And it's interesting, there's a phrase used here that most of us probably don't understand where he says, I smote on my thigh. That's not a phrase we use terribly often, maybe ever. I don't know if I've ever heard it outside of this. It's another kind of euphemism, another descriptive phrase for profound grief. And so in a sense, Ephraim says, when God instructed me, when I realized about the wrong that I was doing, I slapped myself on the thigh. I was so grieved because of what I had done wrong. And so what God would do in instructing us may cause some extreme anguish. It can produce shame and humiliation as he describes here. But thankfully, thankfully there is a fourth signpost on the way back to God. It is the signpost of restoration. God is speaking. And you can put your name there in place of Ephraim. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a delightful child? Indeed, as often as I have spoken against him, I certainly still remember him. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, declares the Lord. Ephraim just represented disobedient Israel. He represented his tribe. He represented the peoples who had gotten into idolatry and disobedience to God. And and talking about this process of being restored, but I just so much love verse 20. Again, you could put your name there in place of Ephraim. Is he or she not my dear son, dear daughter, a delightful child to me? As often as I've spoken against him, as often as we've dealt with sin, I still remember him or her. My heart yearns for him or her, and I will surely have mercy, declares the Lord. That's how the Lord feels about us. When we walk down that road as exiles, away from God because of disobedience, when we, when we move away from him, the signposts that direct us back, God wants us back. It so much reminds me of the well-known story of the prodigal son. The son who went off against his father's wishes and did those things that that no doubt the father didn't want him to do. But the father longed for the time he would come back. And that touching scene at the very end when the father's standing and finally on that day when the prodigal comes back, he's standing and he sees him off at a distance. And he sees him and runs to welcome him. What a wonderful picture of how God deals with us through Christ. When we have gone down the road of exile and disobedience away, God still waits for us to come back. And if we have been wise, we have set up signposts along the way so we know how to come back to God. That's why this passage is so very, very practical. It outlines four key signposts that will guide us back to God when our hearts are finally ready and we're willing to come back. Amen. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord. And your children will return to their own territory. Again, a rich promise that he made to those people who were about to become exiles, about to go off into a foreign land. There's hope 
for your future, a message that rings down to us today. Regardless of our lives, regardless of our situation, regardless of how far we might be from our Father, there is hope and there is a future for each one of us. And how very, very important to be reminded that whatever it is that we have done, there remains a hope for our future. I think that there's nothing worse than reaching the conclusion that there is no hope. It is a very easy thing to do. I have been so bad, I have moved so far from God, there is no possibility of reconciliation. There is no hope for me, no future for me, because I have moved so far away from God. And maybe down to thinking that if I, if I were to travel that road, well, God set up a barricade anyway, I couldn't come back. It is so very, very easy to think that we've done some serious damage and that being restored to God simply can't happen. There is hope for your future. Now, the devil will not want you to think that, and he will accuse you as the great enemy. But as long as we have life and breath, we have the opportunity to return to God no matter how far we have ventured away from Him. I love the promise in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 3. Return to me, declares the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Solemn promise, a rich promise from God our Heavenly Father. If you take a step toward me, I will take a step toward you. If you'll come my way, I'll come your way. I'm that anxious to restore our fellowship and our relationship. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord. You know, another verse that we probably know better out of Jeremiah is found in chapter 29, a couple chapters before this. Chapter 29, verse 11. And again, spoken to those people who were destined to be exiles in a foreign land before they left. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Again, those were words that in a sense were spoken to the people gathered in a, in a town in a city called Ramah, about to, to walk a, a journey of tears and sorrow into a land of exile. But what God is saying that even though you travel that, that road, it is not over. Your failure is not final that you will walk back to the promised land and you will be restored. The signpost that you set will guide you back to the land of promise and guide you back to a relationship with the Heavenly Father. There is a future. Things may look bleak at the moment. There may be a problem in our lives that there seems to be no way around. There may be a crisis that we're in the midst of right now that threatens to overwhelm us. Things may get even worse before they get better, but on the other side of it, there is a future and there is a hope because what God said to Israel, He says to us. Again, there are signposts that will guide us back if we follow them. The signpost of grief, the signpost of repentance, of being instructed by God and then ultimately being restored to God. I felt a bit of urgency in sharing these things with you today because I suspect there's more than one individual in this room that may be taking a look at where they stand in relation to God and saying, I'm in exile, I'm at a distance, and I want to come back to Him if it's possible. And I want to lift up this message of hope out of this passage that we have looked at today. There are signposts that will guide you back. God wants to welcome you back even again if you're at a great distance. He wants to welcome you back. He wants reconciliation with you.